turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, as we uh, wrap up our series, uh, what we've called Grow Up. Thank you, by the way, for your birthday wishes uh, and uh, singing. I know there are a few of us that have birthdays today. Um, some of the great people like Paul Hoagland, and I know Heather Elliott, I believe we all have the same birthday. I don't know if there's anybody else. If you do, l- let me know, because obviously we, we celebrate a day together. So it's good, good. Uh, be good to be 25 and still young. So Philippians uh, chapter 2 this morning. Uh, we've been journeying through this series that we, uh, we've called Grow Up. First of all, I want to say a big, big thank you uh, to our friends here at FCF who are willing to have their face up here uh, for the last uh, few months, uh, to Chris Casto and uh, uh, Joe Cartwright and, and uh, my mom back there, Eleanor Vance, I had to get her up there just to... Unless I, it was great to see her face like that. Um, it's great. Uh, Leslie Hoagland and, and Blake Marquis. It was just good that they were willing to do that. So I just wanted to say thank you to them for being willing to have their face and look like this up here and uh, for the last few months. And uh, hopefully it's been a series that has encouraged your faith. Uh, hopefully it has given you some direction and intention in your, uh, your spiritual journey as we talked about what it means to grow up. And this morning we're going to be looking at something that I believe is the, the cornerstone, the capstone, if I could say, of this series. And if we get anything, and I realize it's not like we remember even the message from the beginning, but if you do, if you get anything out of this Grow Up series, I, bl- I pray that it would be what we're going to look at this morning because everything flows through this reality that we're going to look at this morning. We've talked about the stumbling blocks of growth. We've talked about what it means to grow up. We talked about the direction of our growth. We talked about uh, how we grow through prayer, Bible study, witness, worship, and fellowship in the community of the church. We talked about all of these things, and this morning my prayer would be that as we look at this, we would be inspired and, to, and, 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 and have a declaration that you and I are going to grow up, that we would be able to today to, to put a uh, put a, a nail in the coffin, so to speak, that we would be able to put a, a flag in the sand and say this is our declaration that we are willing to grow up. That's what we need. We need to grow up. And so uh, this morning, I pray that this would be the reality of that as we look at this. Uh, it's funny, you know, I, as my boys have gotten older and I've used them as a lot of illustrations, I, I can't help but just to be overwhelmed with the fact that they're growing up so quickly. And it's been interesting through this series because I've been contemplating a lot about the physical reality of growing up compared to the spiritual reality. And there really is kind of a connection between the two. Uh, as I watch my boys grow up, I think of my oldest son, David, who is taller than I am. And, uh, and much better looking than I am, thank the Lord, they uh, look like their mama. And, uh, and it just, you know, I look at my boys and I just see them growing up so fast. And here's the reality, uh, they're talking about now, I mean, he's 13, talking about, man, it, it's already going to be a couple years and I'll have my license, dad. Um, hey, a couple years, I go away to college and a couple years, you know, and it's like, wait a minute here, no, no, slow that thing down. Uh, you're 13. We're not talking about that yet. Don't bring it up ever again. Thankfully, they're not bringing up uh, marriage yet. Um, you know, girls still have cooties and stuff, which is great. I'm hoping that continues, and I'm going to continue to teach that. That you know, keep away. They, they'll just they will uh, they will uh, uh, destroy your life. So keep away from them. I I have tried. You can ask them. I've tried to convince them that arranged marriage is the way to go, and uh, I've said that to them. I said, listen, don't don't you think I'm cool enough to pick your wife for you? Um, and I. I won't say I've convinced them, but um, I'm hoping that they'll, they'll trust me in that way. I'm kind of kidding. I'm, I'm kind of kidding. But, uh, you know, I remember, I, it's funny, the other day we were getting out, somebody, uh, we were kind of giving somebody something that, well, it ended up we were, my wife was watching a little one from somebody in our church, and so we got out this little, like, high chair that sits on a chair. It's kind of like a, a portable high chair, and she was getting that out, and we've kept some things from when they were babies. Like, we still have a crib that uh, was one of them and kind of passed down through all of them, and so we kept this little high chair thing, and uh, I was just reminded as I came home, and I saw it there in the chair. Allison had it all out, and uh, she was watching a baby, and, and I, uh, I was looking at this thing, and it meant so many memories come back from this little chair, Right? Like, I remember it was in this chair that I looked at my sons, every one of them. We had this little saying back and forth, even when they were really little. Um, I would say to them, how big are you? And they would respond with, this big, right? Or they would say, so big, right? That's, and, and then I realized that I wasn't the only one that did that. Like, there's tons of people that did that. But this common expression, like, how big are you? And they would go like this. They would take their arms and so proud. They would say, so big, um, and we would say, yeah, you're this big, aren't you this big? And then they get bigger. And so I walked up to one of my sons uh, this past week and I said, hey, how big are you? <laughs> what? 
how big are you? Do you remember that? Do you remember when I used, we used to do that? Mom and I used to do that. You sat in the little chair and we used to say, how big are you? Dad, you're just weird. You're weird. <laughs> what are you talking about? And that's somewhat the way spiritual life is, isn't it? I mean, we're measuring ourselves constantly as to how big are we getting? How big is our life growing in Jesus Christ? Are we so big? And the question is, how big is God taking us? How, how great is God making our lives? How great is God transforming us as we're going to see this morning? In fact, the scripture, as we've seen through this study, expects that you and I are going to grow up. And I want to go back just for a moment. I want to remind us of some passages that tell us what we're growing up to, where we're headed, the direction of our growth. Let me give you some, like Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him as before him in love. Now, a lot of people talk about, well, wait, he chose us, he chose us. What does this mean? What does he choose us? Notice the passage in Ephesians 1 tells us the direction of our choosing. It says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And he's writing to believers here. He's writing to the church. And he says, you've been chosen before the foundation of the world that you are going to be holy and blameless. The focus of this growth is that we're going to become like Jesus Christ. Take, for example, Romans chapter 8, a well-known passage. Romans 8, 29 says this. It says, for those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined. There it is. Ooh. Predestination, what does it mean? Well, he tells us. Notice what he says. The text is pretty clear. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of what? His son. He says, here's the, desti here's the destination of all believers, is that we are going to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, there are some extensions theologically that we could talk about and debate about that's been debated for 2,000 years, but the focus of that text, Romans chapter 8, he says, God works all things together for good. Why? Because you are going to become like Jesus Christ. That's the direction of our spiritual growth. Or, or what about 2 Corinthians chapter 3? It says this. It says, now the Lord is the Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I love that. There is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He says we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That as we look in the mirror, we are growing up and becoming like Jesus Christ. The direction of our growth is very clear in Scripture. Or uh, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. This is a future aspect of salvation. We mentioned that this idea of growing up are three aspects. The Bible uses one word to describe these three I ideas of growth. There is salvation the moment we accept Jesus Christ by faith. There is salvation, what we call sanctification, where we are growing up into Christ's likeness. And then there's something called glorification, that is when we become like Jesus, uh, not on this side of eternity, but on the next side of eternity, and that is called glorification. But the scripture uses one word to describe all three of those parts of the process. The word salvation. And here we reference this. Remember we went through this text, 1 Peter, and it says we are to grow up into ultimately future. We become like Christ. Now, there should be no question. I can go on and on. There are many, many, many verses speaking of the direction of our spiritual growth. We are growing up in him. We, are, we ought to be becoming more like Christ. One day we will become like Jesus Christ. That's the direction. Now, if you look at all three of these, uh, all, all of these verses, four of these verses, and we were to lay them out side by side. What's interesting is you would see with this statement three different ideas. There is a past idea that God has declared those who know him will be Christ-like. There is a present reality that is you and I are being transformed right now to that, that hope that God had already had planned that we're going to be like Christ, and there is a future reality when God is going to complete the work that he started. God is going to finish work. There is a past reality, there is a present reality, and there's a future reality. The past promise of God, the present working of God, the future reality of God, where you and I become like Jesus Christ. Now, let's think about that for a moment. If that's true, 
If it's true that every believer in this room, if you know Christ this morning, you are going to become like Jesus Christ, then spiritual growth is less about doing and more about becoming. It's less about the effort that I'm putting in, although there's an aspect we're going to see this morning of that. And it's more about what I'm becoming in Jesus Christ. That he is going to do this work, and so I need to become what he's making me. I need to be more like the person he's intending me to be. And that is how this process works. This idea of spiritual growth. It is more about becoming than it is doing. See, if you've listened to the last past couple weeks and all you've heard is, I need to read my Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to witness more. I need to worship more. I, I need to come together. I need to be a part of the church more. I need to serve more. Then you've missed the entire intention of what those messages were saying. Because you know what's going to happen slowly? You know what will happen when you do that? You will make your spiritual growth a project that you need to get done. And you know what you're going to find really quick? You're not going to be able to get it done. And so you, you, you dive in, you say, I want to grow up in Christ. And you're, I'm going to get her done. West Virginia people say that. Uh, I'm going to get her done. And you don't go anywhere, right? I, I was watching my oldest son. He likes to work with uh, Lego stuff. And he has this computer program where he can build Legos and it's through the computer. And he's real creative like that. Uh, he ha- gets that from his mom. And uh, my second son can talk like me, so he gets that from me. But my first son is creative and, and uh, my second son just won't be quiet. And that's part of the issue. Um, but my first son is, is very creative, and so um, he was there on the computer, and he, has, he had like my computer out there, and then he had his, his laptop that somebody had, somebody had given him and w- built it um, as he worked and kind of learned how to do that, and uh, they were taking classes and said, hey, I'm going to get a computer, and we can, I can show you how to do this. And so um, anyway, he's sitting there working on this kind of Lego idea, and he loves to build Legos. I think uh, one of the things he loved to be is like architect or Lego designer. That'd be the coolest job, right, to design different Lego sets. But he's sitting there working on this, I'm watching him, and he's showing me what he's doing, He's taking a model on this screen that he saw, and he's building it on this screen. So he's taking this model, and he's building it here. And I watched as he was doing this. He's taking the pieces, put it in place. Like, Doesn't this look like this? And I'm like, son, that's like amazing. It's becoming exactly like that, that model. I mean, this picture, I mean, you're, you're getting there. Then all of a sudden, he found himself stuck, right? And, and he's looking at the screen. He's like, I just can't figure out how they did that little piece there. I, I can't figure out what the, how, the, how to do that. And so he's trying to figure it out. He's looking at it. I'm like, son, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I can't, I don't even know how you're doing that. And uh, so here he is trying to figure it out. And he just feels stuck. I can tell he was getting frustrated. I said, man, maybe you ought to walk away from it, kind of take a break and come back to it. And Anyway, he ended up figuring it out. But isn't that the way most of us live our Christian lives? We hear that I'm supposed to be like Jesus Christ. Then we begin to build our life like it's a project trying to get there, trying to get there, trying to get there. And what happens? We're not there. And so many of us feel stuck. Many of us feel our spiritual growth is like a a miry clay, a pit that we're stuck in, and we're just not moving anywhere. And it's no wonder so many Christians kind of give up. Or, Or we might look at it instead of a project, we look at it kind of like a plateau of pleasantry. Like that we get to a certain spot and life is going well and what do we do? We end up just getting comfortable in that spot. And and you know what happens? And I find this so true in my own life. The moment I get comfortable and think, man, I'm doing pretty well. You know what God tends to do? God tends to show me that I need him. God tends to take something away or to break something down to show me that I still need him. Let me show you how this plays out in the scriptures because this is absolutely important if you're going to grow spiritually. And like I said, this is the capstone of this idea of growth, spiritual growth. Take a look at chapter 2, Philippians 2, uh, verse 12. Now, let me tell you where Paul, Paul's at. Paul's sitting in a prison. He begins this passage by reminding the church of Philippi, which, by the way, was one of the most healthy churches that he planted. He planted the church of Philippi, and this is one of the most healthy ones. And in fact, he says in chapter 1, verse 6, he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. He already establishes that God is going to accomplish his work, his plan. Then we come to chapter 2, and he begins chapter 2 by saying, hey, this is what Christ has done. Have the mind of Christ. Christ came and humbled himself in this great passage Philippians chapter 2 called the kenosis. It's the emptying of Jesus. It is where he empties himself of his glory and takes on human flesh. This humility of God where he humbles himself. And that's the story really of Christmas where he humbles himself and becomes a baby. But not only a baby, a baby in a manger having no worth, no value. And all of a sudden he dies on a cross. The ultimate punishment of a criminal. And we see the story of the fact that then... He was highly exalted by the Father, given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And that's Philippians chapter 2. Then he says, verse 12, 
Therefore, based upon who Christ is and what Christ has done for us, notice what he says, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is it in my presence, but much more in my absence. Here he is in prison. He says, listen, I know I wish I could be there with you, but in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Stop right there for a moment. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now we read that and we immediately go, whoa, 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 hold on here. I thought this is God who saves, right? But remember the word salvation can also reference sanctification and glorification. This is a process and here I believe it's referencing that second part, the second and third part of this process, the salvation that we're working out, we're living up to. The word here says do it with fear, phobia, where we get our word phobia, and trembling. Now, very interesting word there. In fact, it's not seen many places throughout the New Testament, this word tremble. Uh, tr- this word tremble literally means, it, it is used to describe anxiety of one who doesn't trust where they're at. They, they don't trust the way they're going, right? So he says here, here we are journeying, and it says we're trying to grow up. We're trying to grow up. We're working out our salvation. We're trying to live our salvation, the salvation that we've received from Christ, the salvation we accepted. And here we are working it out with fear, and it says with trembling because our palms are sweaty because we think, am I doing this right? Like, am I going to make it? Am I going to be like Christ? Like, is this happening in my life? And so we have a little bit of fear, right? And the fear is because we don't trust ourselves, and we shouldn't trust ourselves because if I try to do it on my own, it's a project. It's a plateau of pleasantry. It is maybe a promotional effort that I try to make in my life. If I try to work out my salvation, uh, I, I'm kind of making a, a, you know, kind of a promotional effort. Like, look at my life. I'm trying to live out Christ, right? And it's like a little infomercial of Jesus. That's not the point here, right? It is, man, I'm walking, and I feel like I just can't do it. And I'm wondering, all right, God, what do I do here? Like, I, I'm working this thing out. I'm trying to live out my salvation. But, man, this is much harder than I thought. I, I don't feel like I'm going well. And here he says, working it out. And then I look at that, and, it, I mean, I read that scripture, and it scares me. How am I working out my salvation? What effort can I bring to this that will make God happy, right? Which is what we want, right? We want God to be pleased. I love what he says next. And this is the the foundational idea of spiritual growth. This is the absolute necessity if you and I are going to grow up. Here it is. Notice what he says next. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Wait a minute. I need to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling But verse 13 says, for it's God who works for his good pleasure. So what does this mean? What does this look like in spiritual growth? Well, let let me give you a little little equation, and not that everything comes down to equation, but I think it's important for us to see it in human terms as to how this looks. And I think this passage is pretty powerful in what it's saying. And then we're going to look at the next chapter. We're going to see how this plays out in our lives practically. But notice what he says. So, So he says, in obedience... Work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I should work out knowing that I'm not able to do this. I'm admitting I can't do it. Like, I'm trembling. I don't trust myself. So there's personal obedience. There is an effort that I'm bringing to the table. However, the effort is not going to accomplish the work. It's not going to do it. It's not going to cut it. We're not going to be able to spiritually grow our lives. Paul's saying here, do it with fear and trembling. Because the second part of that is God does this work. This is huge. And this is going to blow our minds for a moment, and then we're going to see it played out in application. So hang with me. God does the work. So I give my life to this spiritual growth journey. I give my life to becoming like Jesus. I work it out with fear and trembling, knowing it is not me who does the work. It is God doing the work the work. And so I begin to see that it is God's power that enables me to live this out. I'm going to become like Jesus. It's declared in the past. It's worked in the present. It's a future reality for me. I work it out, but my working is founded in the power of God, right? It is the, it is the Lord who does this. The word here, by the way, the word work is the word energy. It's where we get, it's the word ernego. It's the word energy. This is where we get our word energy here. We are working, but this is God who works it. It's God who is the one who energizes. It is God is the one who empowers us. And notice the result is 
when we allow God to do his work and we partner that work with with obedience. We obey what he's leading. We obey what he's doing. We follow what he's doing. It ends with verse 13. I love the way it ends. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, I realized in my boys right now, and I believe there's a day that's going to come. You know, as a kid, I remember as a young person, one of the things I really want to make sure of there was one thing that really hit me more than anything growing up, and it was that I wanted my mom to be pleased. Now, my dad died when I was eight. If my dad was around, I'm sure it would have been focused on him, but I wanted my mom to be pleased. Now, I I, I learned how to manipulate that, but I wanted her to be pleased with me, right? Like, if my mom ever cried, I, I would cry immediately because it was something about that. I remember getting in trouble once, and she punished me, and I remember her breaking down and, and crying the one time. And there was a part of me that was like, yeah, it serves you right. See, you shouldn't have punished me, right? There's that, there's that rebel inside. But, then, but the reaction I had was I broke. I broke because I didn't want to see my mom upset. I hate seeing her upset. It bothers me. And so I want to please, right? And so I look at my boys. They're at this place where, man, they want to please dad. They want to please mom. And so I'm trying to push them that, hey, please Christ, please Christ, please Christ. Don't worry about me. You please Christ. I want you to obey Christ. Right? So we're trying to push them in that way. And there might be a day where they're going to struggle and be like, man, that, mom and dad, you're crazy. I, I don't care what you think, you know? So my hope is I burn in them this, this idea that God must be pleased. But listen, here's what it's saying. Because isn't that what we all want? We want the Father to be pleased. We want to grow up and Dad to be happy. By the way, doesn't this overflow in physical life as well? Aren't there tons of people that love their parents to be happy? They, they heard, maybe you were one of those, you grew up and you heard your dad or mom just put you down, put you down, put you down, and you worked and worked and worked to get father's approval. Here, it says, listen, this is beautiful, that you aren't going to just make him happy, that he is going to do the work to make himself happy. And he's going to do it in us through his working, and so we stand back and just live out salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that he is going to accomplish this work. So I'm, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to choose to grow up, but I'm growing up by his power, and eventually he will get pleasure. It'll be to his pleasure. Now, that's pretty deep right there. The Christian life isn't a project. It's not accomplishable. It's not promotable. It's not a pl- plateau of pleasantry. It's not a systematic belief system. It is a dynamic manifestation of Jesus Christ lived out of my life. It is the manifestation of God's work alive in me being lived out. So, so here's what I picture, right? I remember teaching my sons to ride their bike. And I, I know I'm using a lot of analogy to my kids, but we're talking about growing up, right? We're talking about growing up. It's like riding the bike. What happens? And if you had kids, you've done the same thing. You got out there, you got them on the bike. And what did you do to begin? You held the back of the bike, didn't you? At first, you begin with your hand on the back of the bike and your hand on the, the, the handlebars. And you said, let's go. Start pedaling. Pedal, 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 pedal. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And slowly, you let go of one hand. And what do they do? What do they do? No, Dad, don't let it go. That's what they do every time. Every one of my kids did that. Don't let go, Dad. Don't. No, 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 no. Put your hand back up there. And so you do it again. And you go back and up and down the road. Now, maybe you're, the, you're a parent and you, you took them to the biggest hill and you said, you're going to ride it down. Get on the bike. <laughs> Looking back, I should have done that strategy. It probably would have worked better, but... And so then what did you do? Slowly they got confident that you were going to hold the back of the the bike seat, right? And so here I am, I would go along with him, and they'd be pedaling, you're running along, right? Holding the back of the bike seat. This is the image. Now, you know know what eventually happens, right, is they start pedaling, and you know they've got the balance, and so you run behind them, and you go like this. You're not holding on, but you're there, right? And then all of a sudden, what they don't realize, they start pedaling, and, and finally you let go, and you stop, and there they go. And you know it happens again. They, they look back and they say, Brad, where are you? And they start shaking and then they fall down. And we're like, listen, you were riding the bike. You were riding it. This is the image of this passage, right? I get this image here that this is, this is us. We're pedaling, we're pedaling, we're pedaling, but we're not the one keeping the bike up. It's God who's holding the back of the bike, running along with us, and what's going to happen is we're eventually going to become like Jesus in eternity, and when we get to eternity, what happens? He lets go of the bike. And we turn around and we see, wait, 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 God. See, when we get to heaven, I don't think there's going to be anybody in eternity that's going to say, man, look how I grew. Look what I've done. Look how great this is. What are we going to do? We're going to get to eternity. We're going to see it was God the entire time working 
in me. And now he lets go of the bike because it's done. That's the image here, right? Now, the question we have to ask is how is that lived out? I want to take a few minutes. I want us to look in this, how this is lived out. And this comes from Philippians 3. Over another chapter, he goes a little bit deeper as to how this looks in our lives. How this looks, the Father is doing the work, but we're riding the bike. Okay, how does this all play out? Take a look, Philippians chapter 3. Now, Philippians 3 begins with this idea of Paul referencing his past. He says, hey, you, you don't understand. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Man, I had status and worth in my working. And he says, I counted all as loss. I counted all as garbage. The word there, rubbish, literally means dung. I counted as garbage. I counted as, as, as dung to know Christ to know him, and he says, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. That's that great passage in Philippians 3. He says here, listen, I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling, but it's God that's at work, and because of that, all the things that I have had in my life, all the things that counted value are nothing compared to him. That's what we sang about this morning, right? Nothing compares to his love. The riches of his grace are everything. Take a look at what he says, verse 12. Based upon that, he says, not, only, not that I, notice verse 12, chapter 3, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Stop right there. You know what he just says? He says this, when we talk about spiritual growth, when we talk about living out the reality that God is the one at work, yet we're pedaling the bike, he says here, I haven't arrived. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to arrive. I'm not going to be able to accomplish this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I am not yet perfected. Now remember, this is at the end of Paul's life. He's sitting in a prison cell. This is one of the last letters besides First and Second Timothy and Titus. This is probably one of the later letters that he wrote while in prison. And he says, I have not obtained this. I have not been perfected. The word here is mature. I'm not, I'm not mature yet. I'm not there. There's, there's this, this understanding that he realizes he has not made it yet. He is still in need of God's working. Folks, this is the beautiful part. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see this, and we're going to wrap this whole thing together. But this is the beautiful part of spiritual growth. It is a constant understanding that I can't do this. It's a constant understanding that I need God to work this thing out. And so, yeah, I work with fear and trembling because I can't do it. That's the word tremble there. It says I can't trust myself, but I'm going after it. I'm going after it, but it's him. I can't do this. Paul says, listen, I haven't arrived. I haven't figured this thing out. Notice what he says next. But, remember last week I talked about the, uh, the big butts of the Bible. Someone left here and went and secured um, a website for me called thebigbutts.com, okay? Don't go looking in your search engine, big butts. That's not good, okay? But um, it's, they, they went and secured the website, thebigbutts.com, and they said, now, Dave, you have to write that, the big butts of the Bible. And I said, all right, I need, I need to work on that now. Now that we got a website, that makes it official. And it says, coming soon, uh, the, the book, Big Butts of the Bible. So um, this is another one here. This is big because but, a small word with a big meaning. But is a contrasting word. In the Greek, it's very emphatic. It's a, it's a contrast. He's saying one thing, and he's saying here's the contrast of that. So Paul says, I am not able to do this. I realize I have not obtained this. I realize I'm not finished yet. I realize that God is working on me, that this thing is a constant practice. This is a constant working. He says, but, but. This is the contrast. God's not finished. I'm not done yet, but. Notice what he says. Little word with a big meaning. But one thing I do. Well, before that, go back to verse 12. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The word here is dioko, or the word press on. And literally this word dioko, I love this word. It's a pretty powerful word. It's used 24 times throughout the Bible, 13 in, in Matthew through, through John. 13 times is seen in the Gospels. And literally it is almost always used of persecution or hunting. Hunters out there, this is your word. You are dioko. Take that word, put that, hang that in your in your, uh, on top of your, your deer, right? Dioko. It means to be hunted down or persecuted. So Paul here says, I'm pressing on. 
to take it as my own. I'm pressing, and we're going to see this twice in two verses. I'm pressing on. What is he saying? By the way, uh, we're not going to spend time on this, but I think it's pretty interesting. He uses the word dioko because there's another word that he could use here to mean strive or to press. Instead, he uses dioko, which literally has the idea of being persecuted, which I wonder if he had intentions in that by saying, this is not going to be easy. This is going to cost something to press into him. This is going to be maybe even a little persecution to press into him. It's going to cost you. This is, I'm hunting down the, the call of God. I'm hunting down spiritual growth. I'm hunting down the work of God. I'm hunting it down, and it may cost me persecution. The word here is used associated with persecution. He says, I'm going after this, right? I'm pressing. I'm pressing on to make it my own. And notice, I love the second part. He comes back to it because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Wait a minute here. I'm pressing in, but what am I pressing into? What Christ has already done. I'm pressing in that Christ has already accomplished this. I'm pressing in that Christ has made it his own. You, you follow? Are you, are you with me? You with me? You see what's happening? He's saying, I'm going to press but all I'm pressing into is what he's already done and said and promised and accomplished when he came and got me and saved me. I'm going to press in, but he's already done it. Notice what he says. He goes on. So I'm going to press in. How do I do that? Now we come to that phrase I reference. One thing. But one thing I do. Here's how you do it. How do you press in? How, how do you go after it? How do you strive? The word strive is kind of used, and striving may cost. One thing I do. Now, I know most of us have probably read this passage, but do we really understand the depth of the meaning? One thing. By the way, this is, this is huge here, because I think many of us are not going after one thing. The reason we don't spiritually grow is because we're going after multiple things. You want to know the problem with the church in our country? You want to know the problem with Christians? is because we don't focus on the one thing that matters. Right Here Paul says there's one thing, and I love it because he's a preacher, and what preachers do is he says, I'm going to go after the one thing, and then he mentions two things. Watch, I'm serious, you're going to see it. This is the one thing I want, and he says, he says here's, I'm going to make one statement, but I'm going to add, I'm going to add two parts to it. And he was definitely a preacher. This is the one thing, but one thing I do. Folks, let me just ask this. If there's one thing that you could define your life by what you do, what would it be? Is it your job? Is it your family? What is the one thing that you are meant to do? See, this comes with purpose. A lot of people have something to do, but very few people have something to do with purpose. One thing, he says, that I do. This is the one thing that matters in the realm of my life. Notice what he says. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, pressing forward, straining forward to what lies behind. Ahead. He begins and he says, this is the one thing I do, two parts, I forget what lies behind. Now, this is referencing right back to the beginning of chapter 3 where he says, listen, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, Hebrews of Hebrews, I was the man when it came to Pharisees. I mean, I persecuted Christians, I was so, so zealous of the things of the law. I persecuted those followers of Jesus. And you know the story on the road to Damascus, he saw the light, literally, and it was Jesus Christ and it transformed his life. He says, I forget what lies behind. Now, a lot of people have used this to, to think the idea is, I'm going to forget what's happened in my life. I'm just going to forget it. Listen, the reality, let's be honest for a moment. You can't forget what's happened in your life. You can't forget the sin you committed years ago, especially if it's, you might forget the little things, but the big things you're going to remember. That's not the idea of this word. You know what this word literally means? Here, the idea of forgetting from a human perspective, this word literally means to leave the past behind. It means no longer influenced or affected by what happened. Now, this comes both positive and negative. This is not just, I'm going to forget about it. I mean, if you have unconfessed sin, you need to confess that. If you have issues of your life, you need to deal with it, and you need to deal with that. You don't just forget it. That's not the idea of this word. I'm just going to drop it. I'm not going to do what I ought to do. No, no, no. That's not the idea. It's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to leave behind my past success. That's what Paul was talking about, according to the law. But I'm also going to leave behind even my past failures that I've gotten right. I'm going to leave these things behind. You know, this is a big problem, I think, in the Christian realm. Why many of us do not experience spiritual growth. Because we don't forget yesterday. We, we focus on our accomplishments, and many of us live a life of pride. I mean, let me give you an example. Ask many, many of us. Just go around and ask somebody. Say, can you give me 
what has been a great moment of your life? What has been a great moment of your spiritual journey? And almost all of us will focus on a past moment. Now, obviously the moment of salvation is the greatest moment of our lives. But you know what Paul would say in that? Like, you and I would probably pick, maybe for some of you, you would say, you know, I remember when so-and-so died. That Man, God really taught me a lot through that. That was, right, when we would talk about spiritual growth, and we were to go around and say, hey, when was the greatest moment of your spiritual journey? When was the greatest moment of your spiritual growth? Almost all of us probably would have a moment of the past, right? We would say, well, I remember when my dad passed away. I remember when, man, my wife went through some difficult things, and together we had to walk through some difficult things together, and, man, I learned about the Lord there. You know what Paul would answer that question with? Paul would answer that question with, you know what the greatest, the greatest part of my spiritual growing up, you know what it is? It's today. Paul would answer it, today is. Because that's behind me, I'm going forward to something greater and God is moving me to that direction. It's today. Today is the greatest moment of my spiritual growth because I'm not what I was. I'm not, I don't have the success of the past. I'm not living on a past success. My, my greatest spiritual moment is today that God is working in me. God is moving in me. God is doing in me. He's growing me up. And I'm, I mean, I'm learning more about him today than I was yesterday. See, that's the problem is we focus on these past monumental moments. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have monumental moments spiritually. I think that's a reality throughout the scripture. But Paul said today, I, I believe that. I believe he answered that question by saying right now, right now, where God has me, what he's doing in me, sitting in a prison cell. Think about this for a moment. If we were to ask Paul, Paul Man, tell me, tell me when God was moving the most in your life. When was God working? When he was growing you up? Well, you know, Dave, I remember back in the city of Ephesus. God had such a revival. People were coming to Christ, and they kicked me out of the city, and they almost stoned me. Man, you're talking about, I knew God in that moment. No, 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 Paul says, I'm leaving the past success behind. I'm leaving that behind. You know what happens when we focus on the past success? There are three things that said, and this is where many of us find our spiritual journey. Our spiritual life. When I talk about spiritual journey, I'm talking about spiritually growing up. Okay, I'm not talking about just trying, I'm talking about spiritually growing up. There are three places we find ourselves in those moments. First of all, I think complacency. We grow complacent. We get accustomed to staying stuck. We'll complain about it. We'll Facebook about it. I just don't know why. It just seems like I'm stuck, right? I'm not growing. It's maybe because you chose complacency. You're, you're looking at a past experience as your greatest spiritual moment. That's a problem. Because I am looking forward to something greater that's going to happen. That means God's doing the work today. He's transforming me today. Secondly, it could lead you to regrets. You may be regret. By the way, I believe regrets always have power over your ambitions. Regrets always hold back. You will stay unproductive if you have regrets and you live in those regrets. Now, all of us have regrets, right? We all do. But do I let them define my life today? Paul here says, no, no, no. Man, this guy was killing Christians. Man, he could have just wallowed in that. He could have, he could have even been, man, mourn over that. No, he didn't let that. He let that def- define God's growth in him. He allowed that to work at God's growth in him. But he didn't dwell on who he was. He didn't dwell on his past regrets. I mean, I think Paul had some regrets. He was a murderer. Sure, he had some regrets, but he wasn't wrapped in them. And over time, what it does is it distracts us. Right? Because we begin to see all these things that have happened to us and we get distracted with them. And, and so what happens? We then begin to make adjustments to our life based upon these distractible things, right? These things that are distracting us. And we begin to make adjustments based upon them instead of the growth that God is doing in our lives. In fact, I believe some of the most dangerous words that we can use is my life used to be dot, dot, dot. In fact, I even think our testimony, many of us, when we share our testimonies, it's all about what God did in the past. Now, don't throw me out of here. Do I believe it's important to talk about how God changed our lives? Absolutely. Do I think it's important to say, man, you don't know where I was. I was dead in sin, but Christ made me alive. Amen. We ought to be talking that. But why do we not spend just as much time talking about where God is taking us? It's because we have a warped view of salvation. We think that's salvation. No, salvation is that that leads to this, Christ-likeness. So when we talk about testimonies, maybe it should be, let me tell you how God's getting me there. Let me tell you how God is working in me. Let me tell you how God is growing me. Let me tell you how he's moving me. Yeah, I used to be this, but let me tell you where he's got me now. See, what if we transform the way we even talked about our past? Paul, I believe, understood this. He had an insight into this kind of living that said, I am not going to focus on my past. In fact, I'm forgetting the things. I am not allowing them to define me today. I'm forgetting what lies behind me. I love 1 Corinthians 13. It says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. 
I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up the childish ways. He says, I give them up. By the way, I want to tell you that this is kind of a cool thing. I want to make a connection here because some of this is context and in, in, in kind of a, a geographical reality is in Roman thought. Uh, in, in Roman thought in their days, for someone to grow up, here's what they would do. Uh, they would choose in between the ages of 14 to 17. The father would choose when his son would grow up or his daughter would be called a grown-up. Now, um, this is similar, by the way, in the Hebrew culture. Hebrew had the same thing. The father determined when the son or daughter were officially grown up. Um, that was the same, by the way, in the Greek culture. All three of those cultures, here we see them all connected um, in Jerusalem in that day and Philippi in that day. But they were Romans, right? They were Roman citizens, many of them. And so here's how it worked. Very, very interesting how that worked. In the Roman thought, here's the way they did it. They said, okay, 14 to 17, the father said, all right, you're, you're grown up now. And what they would do, they had this big party, this big celebration, and they would take off the childhood toga. Now, the image I had of the childhood toga, you can see pictures of this. There are pottery that has this picture of parties uh, in this day of growing up. Uh, the childhood toga almost was like a cloth diaper that you would wear until you were 14, 15, 16, 17, and you have a cloak over it. I mean, talking about fashionable young people, how many of you like to wear, you know, instead of wearing whatever, you know, skinny jeans and whatever else you wear, how would you like to wear skinny diapers? <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, that's what they wore in the Greek culture. They'd have these togas. Then, at the moment the father determined, they would have this big party, and at some point during that party, they would then exchange the toga. They would take off the toga of this child, and they would give that now grown up, officially, what was called a toga viralis. It was a toga of virtue of life. They would then uh, have that young boy or that girl that was now considered a man or woman to take, the boy would take his ball, a ball that was given to him at birth. A girl would take a doll that was given to her at birth, and they would then go up to a statue of Apollo. If there was a statue in the city, Philippi had one. Uh, Corinth had one. Not all cities had them, but they would have little statues of Apollo, the god. And they would go up to Apollo, and they would give, now this is the picture, they would give up their ball and doll, and they would give it to this false god as a symbol that they were putting away childish things, as a symbol that they were now a man or woman, right? They would forget it. They would leave it. They would go on and now be an adult. Think about that. When, when, when Paul writes it, when God inspires the words of, of 1 Corinthians saying, man, when I become a man, I put away childish things. Every single Roman of the church of Corinth, every, and they had a statue of Apollo in their city, every one of them understood, I'm leaving the childhood things behind. I'm going on to maturity. I'm moving on to adulthood. I'm moving on to the things of God. That's the picture here, right? I am forgetting the things that lie behind. I, I'm not living in my infanthood. I am growing up in Christ. Now, how do I do that? Notice what he says next. Uh, many of us are kind of at that point, right? We don't want to grow up, right? We, we, we're like, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I just want to enjoy life. Notice, notice what he says, and you wonder, by the way, why you're stuck. Maybe because the storyline of your faith is that you're unwilling to make a shift in your life to move toward growing up. Maybe you're stuck because you're choosing to still be a kid, and you're not willing to put away childish things. So you're not willing to put away childish things, and you're never going to understand the reality of your spiritual growth. Notice what he says here. He says, I leave forgetting the things that lie behind. Notice the second phrase. And straining forward to what lies ahead. The picture of this word is I am leaning almost like a racer. He's going to use some racing terminologies like a runner. And what do runners do when they come to the finish line? They're running, right? We just had the Olympics, by the way. In their day, it was called the Isthmian Games. It was a precursor to the Olympics. Man, you're running. And what do the runners do? They're going so fast. They lean in, don't they? They lean in. Lean out. That's the idea of this. It's, I'm straining forward. I'm running for it. You know what happens? If, this, is, this is the picture I think Paul's painting here. And I just image, right? If I'm, if I'm leaning forward, then I'm not leaning back, Right? If I'm striving forward, then there's no way, like, this doesn't work, right? I'm either going this direction or I'm going this direction. That's what Paul's saying here. I'm not leaning past. I'm going to where I'm headed. I'm leading in the direction God is taking me. I'm headed toward Christ's likeness. Therefore, I'm going to strive toward that. 
This won't work. And many of us live in this world and we wonder why we're getting stuck because we're like, we're like in between the tug of war holding both ropes. And we're getting pulled back to this thing and pulled here. We want to go there, but we keep holding on here. That's the problem. And God is saying, no, 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 I'm letting that go. And I'm, Paul's saying, I'm striving forward. I'm running to the finish line with my head out. That's the image here. He's using this racing terminology. This is the one thing I do. He says, I forget what lies behind, and I strain to what lies ahead. I run for it. I pursue it. By the way, this word, this word here of reaching forward, is, is, this is the only place in all the Bible it's used. Right here in this text. It's in the Greek called an apox legomena. It means it's, it's only used here. There's no other place it's called. It's named. It's, there's a word strictly for this passage. We are straining forward. Verse 14. He says, there it is again, I press, Dioko, I press on toward the goal. Uh, by the way, the word goal there is the word scopos. What does that sound like, hunter, hunters? It sounds like the word scope. It's where we get our word scope. He says, I'm going to press. I'm going to run after the goal. My scope is set on the goal. And I love, he says, on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, my eye is focused on the fact that I'm becoming like Christ. Imagine if we lived our life on the goal, which is the upward call of God. By the way, the upward call of God is still, he's using a racing image here again. And, and the image is an athlete, after they would win the race, they lean forward and they would get the prize. The judge would then call them up to the podium. By the way, this still happens in our Olympic Games today. It's patterned after the Isthmian Games. What would happen is they would then say the name of the athlete and what they won, right? And now with the gold medal, whoever, welcome. We welcome them up to the podium with the gold medal, Dave Vance, right? And they would walk up, and the judge would then put on them the medal. Or in their case, it was a wreath, a little wreath thing that you see on many trophies. Wasn't much of a prize, <laughs> What did you get? I got a dying wreath for my prize. Gold medal's a lot better. This is the picture of this that Paul's using is we are caught up, caught up by God, that there's going to be a day. I'm keeping my eye on the prize on the day that God calls me up, right? God calls me up to the podium, and this references judgment. If you look up kind of the way this is used, is the idea one day when I stand before God, he's going to call me up, and that's my prize. I'm looking forward to that day where the work is complete, and I stand before him, not in my righteousness, but in the working of God, in the righteousness of God. And that's the way this looks. It's like, I'm pursuing this thing I cannot attain. I'm going after, I'm keeping my eye on the prize. And notice what he says, verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Let, let us, only let us hold true to what we have attained. By the way, I love this. He comes back to it. Do you notice it? He, he says here, I'm going after this. I'm striving forward for this. But what am I going after? Let us who are mature, let us who are growing up, think about these things. And if you're not thinking about them, God's going to reveal that to you. He says, here's why. Because we're going after what has already, and this is a past tense idea, has already been attained. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Philippians 2. Philippians 1. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. We're pedaling the bike. God's doing the work. God has already accomplished where we're headed. So what are we doing? We're pressing into what he's already done. It's kind of like the, the, image, the image I get, I just have all these little pictures of growing up in my mind. I, like I get the image of like, um, do you remember, remember if you have kids, you remember when your kids walked? Like I remember the boys holding on to the couch and I'd say, come on, come here, come here, Dave, Caleb, come on, come on, come to me. Come to me. They begin to walk. And you know what you do as a parent, right? They begin to take these steps. And they'll wobble and they'll fall down, right? And at first, you're real close to them and you hold their fingers, right? Again, I think this is the picture. Holding the fingers and they walk across. And then slowly, what happens? You begin to pull back and you let them walk a few steps and then they crumble down. They get back up. They try it again. They just try it again, right? And then what happens? Slowly, they begin to start walking. And what do you do? As they walk, you back up. Come on. Come on. 
Isn't that the, I just get that image here. Like what God is saying is I've already accomplished that you are going to walk. One day you are going to be like Christ. Now come to me. And, and, and we look at our lives and wonder, well, God, what are you doing? Why doesn't it seem like I'm growing up? Why doesn't it seem like I'm there yet? You're not going to be able to arrive. You are a work in progress. You are not able to obtain yet, obtain what he's given to you yet. But what happens? We continue to walk. We continue to walk. And daddy's waiting for us, right? He's waiting. And and I remember a Scottish preacher, I read about this, this preacher, his name was Alexander White. He said this, he said, this is what it means to persevere. It means falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up all the way to heaven. What powerful words. That's what we're doing. Man, we're falling down, but we're getting up, we're straining forward, we're going after it. We're going after the prize. Our, our f- scope is set. It's Christ-likeness. Listen, folks, if you want to grow up this morning, if you want to grow up, if you want to see your life be about spiritual growth, you forget the things that lie behind you, press into the things that have already been attained, the working of God that is already going to be accomplished. We press into it. We press into it. We press into it. We strive for it. We're, we're, we're pedaling the bike, but Dad's holding the seat. You follow what I'm saying? He says here, let those who are mature, let those who want to grow up, let those who want to be like Christ, let you have this mind. In fact, skip down. He talks about those who don't know Christ for a moment. He says, listen, you, they're enemies of the cross. We come down to verse 20. Notice how he ends. He says, there are some that have their minds set on earthly things, and it will lead to destruction. That's verses 17 through 19. But then we come to verse 20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, this is the cap. Right here it is. For from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will what? Notice verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him. So the answer is who grows me up? It's him. So why am I even worried about it? Well, because I'm partnering with God in this process and trusting his ways, trusting where he's taking me, trusting where he's going, where we're going to be a part of, what he's doing in my life, where he's taking me. I'm wobbling and falling at times, but I'm still keeping my eye on the fact that dad is waiting, that he will complete the work, he will grow me up. There will be a day I will be like Christ. Folks, what are you pressing into? Like you want a spiritual growth, what are you pressing into? Everyone here is pressing into something. You're striving for something. If you want to be a person that spiritually grows, then you need to press into what has already been attained in Jesus Christ. Pressing in. Listen, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we've made this thing way more complicated than it has to be. I am a firm believer that we, we, we try to complicate these things. We try to figure out some, you know, it's not a secret formula. It is God is doing this work. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey that work. I'm going to submit to that work. I'm going to give in. I'm going to press in. I'm going to reach forward. I'm going to strain for the prize knowing that I can't do it. Knowing that it's the Lord who does this thing. Some of you, you're here this morning. You're complaining about your lot in life. You're complaining about where, where your life is right now. Listen, listen, you know what you're doing? Maybe you don't find offense in that, but you are offending God by complaining about where he has you. You're offending God. Because, you, I mean, you can see this all over the place among Christians. You can read it on Facebook. I mean, um, I, that thing continues to frustrate me. And we put these things out there so freely, and all we're proclaiming is that God has not done a good work in us. You don't like your lot in life? You're taking an offense on what, where God has you and what he's doing. Now, if you've gotten there because of sin, maybe you ought, ought to not like your lot in life. Then change it. Grow up. You wonder where God, why God has you where he has you. Maybe, maybe God is doing a work and you need to trust him, right? That's what it means to press in. It means I might not like where I'm at, but I'm pressing in to the fact that he is going to grow me up and that he has me here right now in this moment, in the place he has you, wherever that may be. And he's saying, I'm growing you up. Will you press in? Will you press in? Will you press in? See, you can't complain about it. Now, granted, there are some, maybe you've been hurt by other people, but do, you, but do you trust God to heal that? Do you trust God to work in that? I realize there are circumstances. I'm not trying to be trite with that. I'm just being honest. Many of us just complain and complain. But By the way, you know what's interesting? We don't have the time, but Philippians chapter 2, read right after verses 12 and 13. You know what he says? The first thing he brings up after he says God is the one who works, he says, now do it without complaining. 
I'm just saying. The Bible speaks all these things. He says, do it without complaining. I should have spent more time on that one. (laughs) But he says that. He says, listen, let go of the past. The things that lie behind, strain forward. There was, I want to end with this. I think it says it well. There was a a Christian English sculptor by the name of Henry Moore. He, He sculpted a lot of Old Testament characters based upon the way he saw them. And uh, he was a well-known Christian sculptor, again, Henry Moore. But he was interviewed by a a British journalist who was a literary critique named Donald Hall. And Donald Hall was a well-known kind of British journalist who was more of a critic than anything else. And so he came to Henry Moore and he said, Henry, Mr. Moore, you you, you know, you've sculpted all these characters. What would you say is the secret? He was interviewing him as Henry Moore, the sculptor, was about 80 years old. And he says, Mr. Moore, you've lived 80 years you probably can tell me what the secret of life is. What is the secret of life? Henry Moore paused, the sculptor paused, and he thought about it for a moment. He said, huh, the secret of life. This is what he says. The secret of life is to have a task, something you do your entire life, something you bring everything you've got to, every minute of the day for your entire life. And the most important thing, it must be something you cannot possibly do. Let me repeat that. The most important thing, it's got to be something that you cannot possibly do. Folks, we cannot grow ourselves up. We cannot become like Jesus Christ. It's impossible. God has declared it in the past. He says before the foundations of the world that we should be like Jesus. God is transforming us to that right now. He's working in us for his good pleasure. And in the future, it will be a reality if you know Jesus Christ. You are going to become like Christ. The question is, not are you able to do it. The question is, are you willing to press in to what he's doing? That's the question. Are you willing to press into the work of God in your life as he grows you up? Because when you press in, guess what happens? You begin to see the growth. You begin to see the work. Let's stand up as we pray this morning.